to the Buy Box Bandits podcast. Welcome back to the Buy Box Bandits podcast. Today we have an, another awesome arbitrage seller, my man Kyle Sennis from Twitter. Kyle is full time OA, so we're excited to hear about how he started. And then uh, within a few months, I think we're able to quit your nine to five, right? Last year. Yeah, so that was in uh, that was in 2020. 2020, oh, even better. Thanks but yeah, thanks guys. for being with us. Yeah, sweet. So take us back to the beginning and how you got started with reselling arbitrage. Like, were you a businessy kid in college and everything, or were you reselling the first thing you found? Yeah, so I mean, I've I've been doing this a long time. Like, I was flipping stuff when I was in high school. Actually, like the the first business that I ran, I was doing it with my mom. Um, we'd buy broken iPhones. I mean, everyone knows the the broken iPhone scheme where you buy OEM replacements for the screens and then sell them as refurbished. So that's like kind of my first dabble in it. It's not really what we're doing now, but sold the uh, miscellaneous stuff, let's say, um, all throughout <laughs> high school and college. And so I've always just been, been a side hustle kind of guy. Um, but then, and I mean, I've tried a lot. I was, I was a day trader for two and a half or maybe three years. Um, kind of like towards oh, wow. the end of college and then into uh, my sales engineering job. So I was doing that on the side. And then it was like the end of 2019, I want to say, maybe like November, December. I had a friend on my timeline that reposted one of Chris Johnson's tweets. And so everyone kind of knows how that story rolls. I got into money Twitter. So I started in and like actually took my account seriously. It was actually it was in February of, uh, of 2020. And so I was already at that point, like I, I got on Twitter money or whatever his course was called and, and realized the power of like gaining an audience on Twitter and then selling off of that. And so I was trying to kind of like find where I was going to fit in with it. Um, I tried a watch brand for a little bit. I actually have prototypes um, of two watches that I made and I was working with a, a manufacturer over in China and that like as I got those samples in, that's kind of when COVID like really kicked off and everything in China shut down. So that kind of came to a, a screeching halt at that point. And so after that, I tried to get into ATMs actually for a little bit. So I was going to random storefronts, barber shops, uh, bars, stuff like that. Trying was this, to was this during COVID? You were trying to get in ATMs. This was literally like it was like right before. So I was kind of trying to do both the ATMs and the watches like kind of at the same time, just because. Like with the, when you're dealing with manufacturers in China, um, and I'm sure you know this from your, your private label stuff, you're dealing with them at night. So I was like during the day trying to hustle and like place ATMs. And then at night I was doing just watch stuff. And then when COVID happened, it shut down like all of that. So yeah. I was still kind of trying to find like where I was going to go. And so I was, I was working as a sales engineer and I mean, I was, I was a desk jockey. I was just, it's customer service and, and, back engineering on like basically I was sizing control valves and regulators. So get some conditions, put it in a program and it would tell me what, what to pick. And so I could work from home. So they sent us home and everything shut down. And at that point I was just, I was still trying to build my Twitter following. And I realized that a ton of people were, were just buying stuff from Walmart and selling it for crazy profit. That's when all the cleaning supplies were going nuts. So that's when I found Joe, I was in PFP for a little bit. Um, and so what I was doing, I really started with weights first. Um, I was going to four to five Walmarts before my morning shift. I started at eight. So Walmart was opening up at seven at that point. So hit five in an hour, get weights. Then I was not the best employee for uh, the remainder of my time at, it was called Caltro, my, my old job. I was basically shipping out orders and going to the post office. Like, um, <laughs> I'm <coffee time>. like <laughs> that's, that's like, uh, that's like what, you know, who Richie Hustles is? Yeah, yeah. So he had a similar story. He was working a job uh, at a bank and uh, he said he didn't like he did. He said he literally said on our podcast, he didn't do anything for like nine months and just collected a paycheck and waited for them to fire him. That's yeah, I was, That's I was not the best. <laughs> Straight past, I it's fast. Yeah, I mean, it was so my job was like was relatively easy. And at the time, my company was making it like a lot harder on us. They were trying to get just more like tracking data on like how we were spending our time. And so they were making, they're basically making us do double work to get it into this tracking system. And I did not like that. <laughs> and while I was doing all this stuff on the side and I kind of like realized where it was going, I just 
kind of completely stopped doing that. So my, my old boss, Richie, if you see this, what's up, Richie? But uh, he uh, <laughs> was getting mad at me for, for the longest time about these orders that would come in because they basically had to do like the double work to put it in. And so I was, I was not a great employee for those last couple of months. And but how long from when you started doing this when you were working to when you quit? What was that like time frame? So I started on April 4th of 2020. Um, and then I believe it, so I, this is, everyone listen. this is not, not advice. I, uh, I was jumping the gun with this quite a bit. I quit my job the same day that I closed on my house that I'm currently living in right now. And I didn't even make a sale on Amazon yet. <laughs> I, was, I was only doing eBay at that point. And so, I mean, I was doing really well on it, but I, I definitely, definitely jumped the gun. And I think that was like in the middle of August. So probably about like four and a half or five months into it is finally when I made that jump. But it was, I've heard it was a couple of people quit their job the same day they closed on their house. Yeah, they yeah. Stick it to the, the <laughs> well, because if you quit right before you close, yeah. the mortgage probably won't you oh, won't be yep. able to get it. Correct? Yeah, because I, I had to wait until it went off, until the loan went off to Fannie Mae because you have to use a W. Well, I was using my W-2. Huh. And so now this year is the first year that I can qualify for a loan again because you have to have two years of 1099 income in order to qualify for a mortgage. Yeah. So that was like yep. my entire thinking on it was like, I was talking to my realtor and she's like, well, do you want to be like close to your work? And I like, didn't want to tell her yet because like she was working with the loan officer. So I'm like, ah, I mean, I'll, I'll make it work. Like anywhere that you can find a good deal. <laughs> I'll commute. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'll, I'll worry about that. Don't worry. And so got in, it was actually, I got really lucky with this place. It was uh, the third house that I viewed and I, so my goal is basically to build up a rental portfolio. And so this is going, this is a three bed, two bath house. So it's going to be in my portfolio for a long time. I don't know with the way that the market's going, if I'll ever sell this, I mean, we'll see when I'm 55 or whatever it is. What but state are you in? Arizona. Oh, okay. Nice. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So I'm in, I'm in North Phoenix. So Phoenix market is gone yeah, nuts. Yeah, it's hot. It's been, yeah. it, oh, it, it's so, been hot before COVID, like Arizona, Utah. It, it's yeah. It's, I mean, it's the with the exodus coming on from california right now like the, uh -huh. i think that arizona and texas were like the two like hot spots and then florida i'm sure yeah as well for people moving out but yeah man i got i got so lucky i i have like a whole calculator breakdown on just like all rental portfolio aspects with rent and upkeep and taxes all that stuff and with the i, I pulled up and um i asked my realtor i'm like what's this going for she's like 295 I'm like, do you run the rent comps on it? She's like, yeah, the stuff is renting out anywhere from a week to two weeks at like two grand. And so I put in some conservative numbers and I was cash flowing like a hundred bucks a month already on it. And so I'm like, okay, like, this is cool. Let's go inside, go inside. Nothing is, is redone. It's a 97 home. And so pretty much everything is, is original. I got carpet in the, in my master bathroom. So I'm like, I walk in, I'm like, oh, I can do so much to this to bring the value up. And so I, I put an offer in same day, got accepted. I was the first offer in, got accepted right away. Um, and yeah, man, I'm this, this place is, I'm sitting pretty on it now. It's probably about like 425, maybe 430 on my, my comps. So, when, when did you submit the offer? So this is it. I got, I got super lucky. My realtor, it was a, it was like a same agency deal or whatever. Not the oh, same yeah, yeah, yeah. So they saw each other in the hallway and she's like, Hey, I have a client that's looking for a house. Yours would fit. Can we get in early? It was the 4th of July weekend. So the sellers were actually out of town in California and they were planning to show it the following week when they got back. I got in on a Wednesday, the other realtor let us in and so we could view it. I was the first person to view it, put an offer in that day and they accepted it while they were in California. So that's funny. I got really lucky. Yeah. And, and in July, the, I believe the real estate market was, it was that it was, it was like May. It started to really start rocketing. It in, in Arizona, it was like October. That's when it started like oh, really okay. going nuts. Okay. Yeah. Cause I know so in April, I got it's in, a huge dip. I was worried. I was worried that I wasn't, cause I mean, there was people that were putting 50,000 plus like above asking yeah. cash offers like same day when they would do an open house. And so I was like the first two that I that I wanted to look at, it was just crazy with what the offers were actually getting accepted at. And so I'm like, man, this may be hard. So I, yeah, I got, I'm very blessed with this one. So I don't know when the next uh, opportunity is going to arise in this market. Yeah. It's hard. Did you put, you put 20% down? No, I did uh, oh. conventional 6% down. 
So, because so, that's what I was going to say. If you put 20% down, you like were saving a shitload from your nine to five, or, or but not, yeah, or no, you, be, you still might have been, but regardless, because you're, you're had, in your 20s, right? Yeah, I'm 26. Yeah. So I had a, I had a decent little war chest saved up, but yeah, not 20%. That's for sure. <laughs> now, I did, did a conventional the, 6% yeah. so that I didn't, because the thing with FHA is when you pull out of your FHA loan at 20%, when you want to go back to conventional, you basically have to double close. So you have to pay closing costs again. And that's why my realtor or my, uh, the loan officer is like, Hey, you may want to think about, you can do 5% down on, on a conventional loan. And so for single family. Um, and so I did six, just kind of made sense. It was like 25 grand down. <laughs> now I'm like, I mean, it's, it's my best investment ever. That's for sure. But that's besides the point. That's not yeah. reselling. <laughs> yeah. So no, you... but the, that's a lot of people's goals though. I think getting real estate, that's one of my goals. I think obviously miles and Garrett as well. Garrett owns his house. Garrett. Right yeah, I used uh, FHA. <laughs> What's up? Yeah, yeah, you, you FHA did. But so a lot yeah. of your early success reselling wise was a lot of the bolo type items like pools, weights, that kind of thing. How does that relate to your current reselling and arbitrage setup? Yeah, so I mean, with everyone's kind of journey, I feel like they they more so get into the bolo aspect. And then once they learn the business, they kind of expand from there. And that was that was kind of like my biggest downfall with my store. Um, I'm, I'm good at abusing things when they work and I'm like perfectly fine. Like my risk tolerance is crazy high. So I'm fine dropping big bags on stuff that works. And I mean, a lot of people know this. A lot of people don't like me because of it. It is what it is. I, I sold a lot of Cronus Zen. I sold like over 2000 of them. Wait, 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 wait. what is this? What, what are we saying? Cronus Zen. It, it was one of the hot bolos. I mean, it's still, like somewhat yeah. profitable now. Okay. But yeah, I, I was the, the Cronus King and there's a lot of people that don't like me because of that. And I can't, I can't sell them anymore. I got, I got an inefficient or, um, uh, what the hell is it called? Um, inauthentic, inauthentic. Yeah. I got an inauthentic yeah. claim. And so what I was doing, I was buying from Amazon UK and getting them shipped over here and then just reselling. So it was just regular A to A and someone, uh, reported me for inauthentic. And so, because it's A to A, you don't have invoices. All you have is the order confirmation. And so now they're getting better with that. But before, like I could not get, I was on the phone with supervisors. Like yeah. there was some people that were telling me that, that we were going to clear it up because of the proof that I was providing. Then their supervisors overrided that and canceled it. And so it was, that was a, that was a big hit on my store just because like I was, I was complacent with that and I was relying on that for so long. And that kind of coincided just with some personal stuff that I was dealing with in the middle of last year. And so that I, I kind of posted um, the story behind that on my Twitter. It, it basically like kind of ruined my business just because I was in a funk and I didn't work on it. So I, my store kind of just sold out of all my inventory that I had in FBA. And then I was barely kind of replenishing it from there. And so when that happened, I mean, once I got out of the funk, whatever, it's doesn't girls are girls. So <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> but, um, when I, when I finally got through that, I kind of took a step back from the market and I'm like, okay, I understand like how this works, but I want to know more like how the big sellers are running their business and how, cause I saw that people were, were somewhat automating it. And I'm like, I need to figure that part portion of it out. And so that's kind of where it has led me now to my business. I'm trying to outsource everything that I possibly can. I mean, you guys have some great information and, and people on the podcast. Like I said, I, I watch this thing all the time. So I pick up a bunch of tidbits from people. And I mean, our, our time is our most valuable asset. We only have 24 hours in a day. And so if you can multiply that by getting other heads in your business, then it's only going to allow you to expand more. So I've really, I've really taken the plunge with VAs. Um, I got two VAs that are sourcing for me right now. Nice. Um, so, I mean, just the Typical day, they, they bring me a list. I go through, I scan which ones that I like. I place test orders. Um, and so I'm using a prep center in uh, Montana right now. Um, I'm actually looking at the screens above this. And so um, scanning through, picking the ones that I like, sending test orders to the prep center, making sure that everything goes as planned, get rid of the ones that tank for whatever reason or just don't sell as well as I expect them to. And then I'm just placing big replant orders. That's kind of, I'm at the point now where I've got a list of about like 20 to 25 good SKUs of what I'm ordering replants on. And now I'm starting to go pretty deep in them too. I, I actually, one of my best replants, um, I was buying off Walmart 
and it's, it's a third party distributor. And so I was placing big orders and he realized it and he messaged me through the, the Walmart purchase. And he's like, Hey, do you want like uh, bulk discounts and like other products and stuff like that? I'm like, yeah. So I actually just got like my first wholesale account kind of opened up with him and now I'm placing some big orders and he's the price actually rose on retail. And so now I have like an $8 a unit advantage over other people and it's already profitable. So at the original price. So that, that's one of the unique things about OA. If the, if the lead is already profitable on OA and if you could get it wholesale, you have even more of an edge on everyone else on the listing because you can drop it lower. And then, you know, sometimes that's where people might think you're selling at break even, but you're just really not. Yeah. I mean, it just, it depends on, <clears throat> it depends on the price that you're getting at, but that's, yeah, that's really what I want to, to eventually move into is just wholesale accounts where I can get them. And I'm going to do that outreach too. I just kind of haven't really set up those systems yet, but OA and wholesale combined, I mean, you can't really go wrong with it. It's the best of both worlds. And it was interesting. How did you find the, how did you find the international ODA or Amazon to Amazon? Cause it's funny, Danny and I were talking about- I was it. just going to say that. Yeah, we were talking <laughs> to someone recently. I won't say his name cause it wasn't public, but I'll tell you after. But uh, he, he was- um buying on Amazon US and then reselling on Amazon UK. And he still does it. It's like a significant yeah. portion of his business. And that's the first time I heard it. And then now you're using A yeah. as well. How'd so you find it? Were you, were you using a, a reshipper to get stuff from UK to the US? Had it been, right? No, no. Well, it, it just goes through DHL. So because you're, because you're buying from Amazon, like they take it's free shipping, like it's free returns. And so like, so they, <laughs> was it, it was your US Amazon account. Yeah. Well, no, not, oh. so it's my, it's my, uh, my business account or whatever, right. but yeah, U S based. And so just placing regular eight a orders. And the only reason that I found it is because I was like, so I was sourcing from GameStop. I was sourcing from collective minds for Cronus, um, and just other, other areas. And so I was on the main, uh, main listing. And then all of a sudden I see price drops like crazy. And I look at the seller and it's like a thousand plus units and it's from Amazon store UK. And I'm like, wait, what? Hold on. And then I had the thought and like immediately I'm like, oh my God, I get A to A these. This is awesome. And so that's when I started like that. I was putting up like 60K months with that because I was, I was selling like, so there's actually two listings for Cronus. There's a main listing and there's a secondary listing. And I had the buy box metrics for both of them. So when I came on the listing, I basically owned it and I was selling anywhere from 40 to 60 Cronus a day. And they're going for like 150 a pop. So how long was, was the doing, inbound shipping? Zero free. Oh, how, how long, long did it take? Yeah. Oh, oh, how long? Usually about like two weeks. It depends on, so you know how, like when Amazon expects stock, they'll list it as temporary. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so oh, sometimes when you get those, it can be anywhere from three to four weeks. I mean, on like a, a bad time, you could get like five maybe, but if they have it in stock, you can get it in like two weeks, week and a half. Have and you, you would just run up tens at a time. Oh man, I was ordering like 300 at a time. <laughs> Did they ever get canceled? Big bags. What's up? They never got canceled? Nope, not yeah. once. I wonder if the seller noticed that the same person kept buying these. <laughs> and it wasn't just me though. There was a lot of people that were that were kind of doing that. But I mean, now they, they raise the price on it. They're like maybe five or 10 bucks below just what regular resale is. And so they kind of ruined it. But yeah, I mean, I'm they're, they were making so much money off of it. And I don't know what price they were getting it from Collective Minds, but I'm like, my, my thing with Collective Minds, because they, they basically blacklisted me, it's like they, the reason that their product is selling for so high is because their manufacturing is all messed up and they're constantly out of stock. So if you guys would take the money that we're just handing to you because <laughs> it's so damn profitable and they sell so much, like you can fix your, your pipeline issues, but they don't want to do it. And so they just punish resellers for whatever reason. But That's what it is, part of the game. Have you heard about uh, Amazon's I don't know if it's like a new official policy, but I, I'm pretty sure I read somewhere they're not really allowing A to A anymore. Or they're like, I know they won't accept it, or they, well, I, I think like they that. just might not be like explicitly not. A, like your Amazon US account, I read on Twitter someone got banned for it. If it's the same account and you're buying on Amazon US to resell on Amazon US, they'll just ban you. Well, no, the, the thing is you're restricted to use their prime service. You could ship it standard. You just can't ship it prime because that clogs up their fulfillment. That's like the actual TOS. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah, saying. I, like saw, I know what you're talking about, though. I, right, I but saw, you, you can ship it non-prime. Yeah. Oh. And so 
I saw, I saw, I know exactly what you're talking about. I saw that it was, it was in like a Facebook group or something. I actually yeah. joined that Facebook, yeah. Facebook group and I was asking around. I'm pretty sure what they were doing was just drop shipping from Amazon to eBay. Um, yeah. I don't know if you guys know what dropship calendar is. I was, I was in that for a little bit, but um, basically it's just an automatic software that drop ships from, I mean, I'm pretty sure that mainly just sources from Amazon and sells on an eBay store. Um, and so people were getting in trouble with that, but yeah, like Garrett was saying, if you do, that's why I have the, the non or the uh, business account and that's non-prime. You can do a prime business account, but I have it non-prime. So it doesn't even, mm. it'll try and get me to upgrade, but I, I basically just get the, the standard shipping rates and it's still okay, free. That makes, that it just takes sense. a couple of days longer. So they just don't want people run. vlogging on prime, but like, how yeah, much exactly. are there, people like, run significant, like, significant size businesses A to A. I know, but I don't think it's yeah, clogging up prime. Like, hey, no, we're talking I, about the I didn't country. make the rules. I don't know. No, I know. It's just funny though. <laughs> and it's interesting. There's a couple of things to touch on, but yeah. And because you were getting those items so much cheaper, there's little competitive advantages like that all the time. Sales tax, someone buying wholesale that you're buying arbitrage. This, for example, that people that like you find when you source on your own, when you're, you know, when you're self-reliant BAs, all that stuff that just come from digging. You know what I mean? That you're not going to get when you're reliant on, you know, some of these different services people offer and everything that just come from that independence that you also get full access to. And that's why I tweet about all the time getting sourcing independence as quick as possible. It sounds like that's paid off a lot for you. Yeah. I mean, it, you don't, you don't want to really rely on, on people to, to feed you. You want to learn how to fish. And so once you get good at sourcing, I mean, it's, it's really, it's just, I can look at a, at a keeper graph and know like basically instantly if something is going to be at least something that I should spend money on to test. Like you, you know, it's basically night and day, like once you actually get used to it. And so from there, I mean, <clears throat> Miles, I actually commented on, on one of your tweets about this. It's you can, cause like I'm decent at sourcing, but like you don't necessarily need to be like great at sourcing. You just need to be good at qualifying leads. And that was a very good really, point. I, I remember that I co-signed that. That was a really good point. Yeah. Because it's like, you can be a, you can be a really crappy sourcer, but if like, if you understand your, your buying process and you can communicate that to VAs or whoever it is, yeah. someone that, that helps you that you can outsource that work. Like as long as you can like tell if it's a good lead or not, then I mean, it's, it's, you're off to the races with it. And yeah, we lost Danny here. Why, why so, my astronaut camera went off? Oh boy. Um, so Kyle, a lot of people like struggle uh understanding the metrics kind of behind test orders. Walk us through your process on how deep you're going for test orders and all that for the audience. So I I actually kind of switched this up um because of the prep center. So when I was previously placing test orders. I was doing, I mean, like everyone's kind of heard that the golden rule is 18. Once you get 18 units and it goes to the same prep center or to the same fulfillment center. And so that's kind of what I was doing. And I wasn't nearly testing as deep as I am now. Um, and so I kind of took that mentality into the prep center too. And I feel like I, I went wrong on that up front just because I'm placing a lot of test orders and I wasted more capital than I needed. So now I think that generally my sweet spot for tests is anywhere from three to five units. I can tell if something is going to sell well, if I mean, hopefully it doesn't ship partial and they all ship together to Amazon. But if, if stuff sells well, and I, I basically, I know my criteria going in, I have my certain buying criteria. And as long as it meets that criteria or better, I mean, sometimes sellers drop off and then you can sell it for even more. As long as the same Profit margin is there to a relative extent. Sometimes you can get crazy margins and it drops a little bit. And so it's just a, as long as it's in the acceptable range with your profit margin, as long as, I mean, I hate when listings get flooded with sellers. So if I see that, even if I can sell something for, for decent profit, if I see that it really got flooded, I'll like, I'll pump the brakes on it and maybe just do like another set of test orders to see where it's at. Um, so I, I stay away from seller increases. Uh, if, sales rank jumps for whatever reason, if you're dealing with seasonal items or whatever it may be, whatever the reasoning. Um, or if, like I said, if something just doesn't sell as well, like I've, I've had very high rank stuff that's on a certain variation that for whatever reason, that variation just like doesn't sell and keep it doesn't necessarily track that as well. Like when you do like a set on shoes and something like that, you do a size 10 to size 11, sometimes it'll have the same sales rank and won't differentiate it. And I feel like those are kind of the problem listings too, that I've, I've noticed I've had issues with where it's like, it's like a 10,000 rank in a shoe and I have three of them in stock and it's taken like a week to go through it. I'm like, well, this doesn't necessarily make sense. 
But so it's as long as it kind of meets those metrics, I do three to five and I can tell if it's, if it's selling well, it's going to sell relatively quick based on my metrics. Cause I, I tend to stay in faster moving stuff. I don't really like, I like churning and burning inventory. I don't like holding on to it. So, I mean, as long as it meets that, then after that, I kind of, I ramp up, but I ramp up relatively quickly. So if I, if I sell through my five, like really quick, I'll place an order for 50 next time. See how fast I go through 50 from there. I mean, that's kind of what I did with this, this main replan that I've been talking about. Now I'm up to like 150. And so if that sells well, then I'll probably go to 300. And so, I mean, it's just, it's being comfortable with the sell through rate. That's one of the best things about test orders is you get to actually feel the sell through rate before you have to put a big lump sum of money on something. Yeah. I, I feel like that's the one thing that people get caught up way too much in is just how many the test order. Right. And we always just tell people just order 10, order 20, just to see how it goes. Right. Make sure the packaging is what you think it will be. Uh, what sort of uh, margins are you purchasing at? So I tend to stick, I mean, I more the better, obviously, but I tend to stick in like the 30% range for ROI. Um, sometimes if it's like a decent, like profit per unit, I'll go to, I have one that's like 15 ish. It's a shoe, but I mean, as long as I'm making like 20 bucks on it, then I'm, I'm fine with that. So it's, it's more so for me, just like dollar per unit that I can make. And then you kind of just have to be wise about how you're spending your capital. So like, if you have it, like a 15 percenter, but you can sell 30 of them in a month then maybe you want to go a little bit deeper on that than something that's 40% margin, but you can only sell 15 of them. I mean, so it's just a, it's a cash flow game at that point, but that's kind of just my thinking on it in general. And there's also ease of purchase, you know, a 30% ROI Walmart replen you can buy daily is much better than an 80% thing you have to drive all around to get, in my opinion. And a lot of people disagree with that, but I, I totally agree as you scale, you sacrifice margin, but wait, make way more money with the volume. Ease yeah, of purchase, even the I like sites that. With like, Ease of purchase, well, oh, you like that? I've yeah, never heard you say it like that. Yeah. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> I mean, even with like sites like Target though, or sites that limit you on, on buy quantity, it's like it, the, the easier it is to purchase, the better, obviously, because like we're not going to be buying stuff that's, that's not profitable, but I love Walmart replants because they're always available. <laughs> That's that Walmart is probably still to this day my favorite sourcing website. I get a yeah, lot. They don't of cancel you, do they? What's up? They it's don't hard cancel to get you, banned on Walmart. Yeah, no, I, I haven't done Walmart Plus. I've heard of people getting banned on Plus. That makes sense. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I haven't. I haven't had. I actually haven't even been shut down by Target. Oh, oh there you really? Go. I did it. You just <laughs> everyone did it. Made, like, just everyone did it. They, they, just they didn't even let me submit one order. I submitted one large order. And that oh, was it. not gonna yeah, order. Danny, no, no, I just, I just banged on wood. <laughs> Danny, careful with it though. I'm Target Danny, swindled me, bro. Yeah, Danny got the Target credit card placed one bro. order, and they just, they Dude, just pulled. I, the I was so <laughs> mad. I, I, I got fucked by that because then I, I, I got messed up my whole thing trying to get a new Chase card because they added a new open account. Yeah, Target screwed me. Yeah, but yeah, I because I, I got the red card too, and I really wish that I got the Walmart City five percent card instead of Target, just because I shop on Walmart so much more. But yeah, they uh, I've I've heard horror stories. I've yet to, yet to experience it, but I'm sure it's in my future at some point. It's in every reseller's future. You Target said doesn't even ship to Wilmington. <laughs> Who? <laughs> like Wilmington at all? I guess a couple really? of our clients have said the. Uh, Target reaches out to them and say Wilmington is a fright forwarding city, so they won't even touch Wilmington. <laughs> Dude, I don't, I don't get oh, that. Man. I don't get that at all. Like, I, I don't understand like that model at all. Yeah, Wilmington, it's literally along ninety five. But I mean, yeah. I guess because they want like normal people to get it, and so they get out of this. I don't know. It's, it's just hypocritical, though. So Walmart <laughs> and the Target are the biggest resellers there is. It's very, <laughs> yeah, it's very odd. Yeah. Um. So you said you have VAs, right? You said you have two. Yep. When did you first get those? I got them like almost concurrently. So I did, I did two processes to get them. Um, I went through fast track FBA for one of them and actually she, she's my favorite. She, she started off relatively slow, but we've been working together 24th. It's probably almost close to two months now. Nice. Um, and so she's getting better by the day and she's my favorite now. So I went through that service to get that. 
Um, and then I also kind of had just a battle royale with uh, some VAs. I went on onlinejobs.ph <laughs> and um, put out just, I mean, the, the typical OA sourcing lead. And I got three of like the most qualified. I just talked to them. I uh, told them to add me on Discord. So I just had conversations with them in Discord, kind of just pried into their previous experience, like kind of what they do to source, that type of stuff. And if they could talk the language, I mean, you can kind of tell like, after talking yeah. 15 minutes with them, if they know what they're doing or not. And so took the the top three, had them source for a week and just qualified all the leads, bought the ones that I liked and uh, just picked the best one. So that's how I got my other VA. I got her before the fast track FBA one that, that came probably a week after. And so I introduced them both together. They, they source in the same Excel sheet and we have a group chat in discord too. Nice. What's yeah, we have our SCA. I've never heard of that as well. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a he is a big or? personal brand. Yeah, we should get him on the podcast too. How much was it from Fast Track FBA? Uh, don't quote me. I believe it was around like nine hundred bucks. Oh, so that I mean, is that I, I, that sounds very reasonable. And then know? that's what I'm saying. Man. And then do you pay the hourly wage to the VA or to Fast Track? No. So once you just pay for the service of, of they hire them from online jobs and then train them up. And then once you onboard them, you're good to go. So I handle my transactions with her like individually. Yeah. That's so, a, that's like a extremely fair, anything like that's, yeah. that's what I'm saying, like five K is fair to be honest. Cause like, and I mean, it's, it's a quality VA they're getting, they're getting people that are brand new to it from my understanding on how it works. Like they're getting brand new people. They're not getting previous, like previously trained employees or whatever that have been let go for whatever reason. And so like, they don't have any like specific tendencies and the way that they train them obviously is working. Like I like, I like, like a lot. And so I highly recommend it. And everyone always wants to like just poo poo spending money on stuff, but that's a business expense. Like I can just write that off at the end of the year. It's not a big deal. Dude. So I feel like it's such a no brainer. I mean, if you don't want to, if either you're not, necessarily as like experienced as some other people and you don't feel comfortable teaching a VA because it can be difficult teaching a VA, especially with the yeah. language barrier. But I mean, if you're, if you're not necessarily comfortable with that, or if you just want to just outsource it and you don't want to do that, like having that service provided to you is, is perfect. I, I just DMing him. I'm like, dude, this is a, this is a great idea. Like that is a, yeah. that's one hell of an agency idea because you're doing good things. You, yeah, you, Did you have any you, input into the training? No. No, it's all just a pre uh, pre written could, program. Could you sure like return have. your VA if you didn't like him or her? I mean, it yeah. Was. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, that, I mean, it's a good question, but I'm pretty sure they, I forget how long the stipulation is, but it's like either if, if you are unsatisfied with it yeah. or if your VA quits for whatever reason, like they'll provide a new VA for you, like for free. That's sick. That's and, like, and up to, up to a certain service. point. Yeah, no, up to, it's up to a certain point. There's a time limit on it. Don't quote me, but yeah, I mean, it's like, they they sold me. I'm not that hard to sell in business to business, but it's like Dude, they, anything, they sold me anything right away. that's a like that's a revenue generating activity. So like you got it down. You're not prepping products because that's not revenue generating. Sourcing and that's pretty much it. Like that's yeah. the only thing that's it's sourcing and buying and even the buying. Like you you could delegate, but then that yeah. then there's a whole trust aspect you have to go through that. But yeah, that that's really cool. I've never heard of that. So one thing I'm curious about is like, what does your family and like friends from before reselling think of in just a few months, you being able to go full time now doing this, you know, for a living and everything. I'm curious, we'd love to ask our guests that are full time what their close ones thought when they said they're just uh, flipping stuff on Amazon for a living. So I actually like didn't really get too much pushback from my family. Some some aspects of my family that we don't necessarily talk to all that much uh, definitely gave me some pushback on it. And I mean, just it's, it's the, the Karen response that you're scalping. It's people natural. Yeah. Yeah. It oh, is, they, they said you were scalping is. people. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, dude, I had one of my friends that said it and I was like, shut the hell up, man. Like, like on my timeline to too. And I'm like, we're family. Like you shouldn't be doing that. That's so funny. <laughs> That's but funny. Everyone yeah. that, everyone that was close to me, like, both understood kind of like my vision for what I was doing, just entrepreneurial and like social media wise, they kind of, cause I was doing the social media and trying to build it up before I found reselling. And that's when I actually got like the most flack, like not necessarily from family, but friends and stuff like that. Like trying to build your social media following just out of nowhere. Like when you're not doing that, like that, I got the most pushback there. But then once I started to find success and I, I, I'm very glad that I did it. I kind of just instinctually did it. I don't really know why, but Gary it's- Gary V, like, I, 
I know you're a Gary V guy. He helped. Oh yeah. No, yeah. Well, no, but I was, yeah. He definitely, he definitely helped. But yeah, I mean, I guess it was just in the back of my mind, but I, I started like posting from zero. I was like, this is what I'm going to try and do. This is day one. I have $0 in sales. And then I just kind of showed the process and I was putting up numbers quick. And so like, then that's when my friends and family kind of just like understood. They're like, okay, now I get why you're kind of building the social media behind this. And obviously like you're making money, like that's cool. And so it really wasn't, wasn't too much of a pushback. And even when like my biggest worry, one of my biggest worries when I was quitting my job is my dad helped me through college. And I was like, I mean, I still have, I have a decent amount of student loan debt, but like he put some money in too. And I was going two, two and a half years in my job as an engineer, like a degreed engineer. And I'm quitting that and I'm going to sell on Amazon. And so I was, I was a little bit worried, but he's actually like super supportive of it too. And he's, he's more just happy that like, I enjoy what I'm doing now. Like I was, I was sitting in my cubicle, just swearing after I got cussed out by a customer on the phone and like this, I I'm sitting, you guys can't see it, but there's a, a cockpit of, of eight monitors that surround me and I get to, I get to work from work from home and go to the gym at 10, 10 AM. I mean, sometimes I go at 5 AM, but it's like, just, I have, I have full autonomy over my day. And once I kind of just like explain that vision to everyone, they were pretty supportive of it. Dude, Thank that you. is that, that f- the feeling of like full autonomy over your day. Like when I moved out of my parents' house, moved to Miami, I felt that for the first time in, my, in like in my life. And it's just, it is the, the greatest thing. It, I can't explain. It's the greatest thing ever to be able to do whatever you want when you want. It's, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I can yeah. never go back. I can never go back to the old way. And yeah, I don't yeah, think I, I can mean- do like there's there's a nice like people talk about on Twitter how like the weekdays at like the Tuesday 11 a.m. being able to do whatever like when you see people at the gym you know everyone there either like quit their job or like doesn't have and it's a beautiful thing absolutely if there's anything you could do differently on your reselling journey to maybe help someone in the audience if you could go back knowing what you know now what would that be if anything hmm, that's a good question I'd say probably like going, cause you always hear go wide, not deep. And I definitely understand that more now as I'm trying to scale, I'd say like, don't be afraid to go deep. If you find a winner, like obviously abuse that as much as you can. But for me, like building out my SKU list and my catalog of items is way more important to my business now. And I'm like really taking that serious. And that is allowing me to do so much more with it. And so if I started that earlier, I'd probably be like where you guys are at. now. And so I think that like not only doing that, but then also like I, I prepped for way too long. And so getting a prep center, just, I, we were talking in a Twitter space, actually, uh, Miles, I joined like right as you were leaving earlier. Um, we were talking about prep centers and the question came up uh, like, would you start with a prep center or would you want to like do the prep yourself first? And I was saying like, I'll kind of take like a, a different angle on it. Cause most people are going to say like, you should do it yourself like first and get that experience. It's like, uh, cause I had a friend that was asking me the same thing. And I'm like, honestly, that was like the biggest pain point in my entire process was prepping. Cause I'm working. I mean, sometimes on big shipments, I'll, I'll work like seven, eight hours into the night. And so it's just like, it's a pain in the ass. You got to buy a bunch of supplies to do it. And with people that live in, in income tax States, I live in Arizona. My, my buddy lived in Illinois. Um, I'm paying 8.3%. I don't know what they're paying, probably close to nine. You almost automatically make back all the prep costs just by the tax savings that you get when you're sending the tax free States. And so it's not only just the, the like, the ease of service where you don't have to deal with, with prep center. You're, I mean, arguably you can make more money doing it that way. If you're saving more on the taxes than you are paying for prep, like it's just adding into your margin. And so I think that just getting set up with that as soon as possible, and then trying to go wide and test a bunch of stuff and get a large catalog, as opposed to just a couple of winners that you're going to ride out until they die. Like that's how my business came to a screeching halt. So I'd say to, to avoid that as much as possible and outsource your time. That's yeah. the biggest thing. I was talking to a friend recently who I've been trying to get an Amazon for a while. And, um, and initially I was like, yeah, bro, like you got to get the printer. You got to get all the stuff. You got to get the labels. And I t- was speaking to him again last night. And I was like, maybe you don't. 
right? Maybe you use a prep center actually, because you don't really need to be doing it yourself. Cause like you said, like I, I that was my biggest pain point as well. When I was first starting is the, the prepping. And then if you don't have a lot of money, like the printer, everything that's like $400, like it's definitely, uh, definitely could be beneficial just to start straight away with a prep center. Cause it's a, it, it sucks doing it without a good like label printer. You got to do the 30 yeah. ops and you got to like, you're, you're oh, printing yeah, out, printing out yeah, four by six awesome. labels. Yeah. On, on a print. Yeah. That, that, that sounds terrible. Yeah. That's actually really not a bad idea. It's just I, part of me kind of, yeah, I don't know that, that, that perspective, the not having to spend the money on supplies is huge. Well, yeah, Cause if that's you don't have a lot of money, like this, the, my, this friend I'm talking about does not have a lot of money right now. And I'm like, okay, well, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I guess it would be beneficial to not pay for a printer and labels and everything. And instead just pay the the dollar or dollar 50 or whatever prep costs. It just makes so much more sense. And it's well, and what most people don't realize is and Kyle hit it on the head, you could potentially be actually saving money by using a prep center. I mean, depending on your buy cost and your, your state, right? Yeah. A lot of states, if your average buy cost is over 25, 30, $35, I mean, you could be saving 25, 30, 40 cents every single unit. I mean, which would certainly add up. So obviously we don't know your prep, right? We don't know you, or we know you don't source. What sort of stuff do you do in your business day to day? So, I mean, right now I'm, I'm basically just managing the VAs now for my Amazon yeah. store. And it's great. Like I, I've really taken a lot of time back. I mean, if I, I mess around, I'm, I'm doing multiple things. I'm on social media all the time and watch a bunch of videos, like <laughs> sending reels to my friends. But like, if I really just like sat down and went through my entire list every day, I could probably clear it in about an hour and a half and just be done. And then just making sure like the, the screen that I'm looking at right now, making sure everything's fine on the back end with my prep center. That's based in emailing them back and forth with certain communication aspects, whatever I need to do. That's, that's literally it. And so now at this point, that's why I'm like really telling my friends, I'm like, this VA stuff works. Like you got to look into it because like now I've, I have so much freedom to do more stuff, which I am uh, taking advantage of, I will say. Yeah. <laughs> And that's All right, it. and uh, last question: What is that stuff behind you? There's a light. Uh, what? So this this little guy? Yeah. That's oh, ATSP. Gar that's damn. Okay, oh. Garrett, Garrett and I cannot <laughs> figure it out ever since. Ever yeah, since Miles and I have been low key texting this whole time. We're like, yeah, Dude, we what is that down. behind right, him? Cool, <laughs> Cool. His guess was a coffee maker. My guess was uh, bro, because I saw there. there's something. There's a little like white thing that I thought was the uh, the coffee packets or whatever. I saw oh, like right. what this looked like a... like screws or something. No, so it's it's ATST, and then I got my lattice one. This is my hard wallet. So for all the oh, haters out there, I, oh, all the all you the. Do you have a lot of your like? Do you have a lot of money in crypto? <laughs> You were uh, you were late to the party, my friend. Um, <laughs> oh, no, oh, God. No so I actually, Miles, I was watching a video the other day or one of the podcast episodes, and you said you lost three k. Oh, yeah, yeah, you I, lost a I, lot more than that. You lost a lot. No more way. Yeah, dude, I lost like twelve e, so I lost like thirty k. Oh my. God. Yeah. Wait, how did you lose twelve e? Uh, so my MetaMask got compromised. And yeah. I'm uh, I'm just. I'm, a, I'm an idiot. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I learned better, how, better now than in the future. You know, when that's you say, and I mean, now. like, honestly, money is fake. <laughs> like, it's just, <laughs> it's just fake at this point. That's how it feels. And I know I'll make it back, but it taught me a valuable lesson. And everyone, everyone in the comments on that tweet, I mean, I put it, I put everything out there. And so everyone in the comments wanted to be a, a dickhead on that. You should have gone hard wallet. <laughs> I didn't it's know. the first thing I bought. So quit giving me crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you gotta clip that you gotta clip that post That's yeah so thanks for coming on kyle where can everyone find you on uh on twitter here uh so i'm at kyle Senes on all platforms so fantastic I'm sure it says it in my name somewhere but k-y-l-e-s-e-n-e-s -E -E yep so that'll be linked below as well and thank you guys all for listening thanks again kyle for coming on and if you're not already buy box bandit discord it's linked below as well you guys should go join danny's gonna kill me if i didn't mention that we'll see you guys on tuesday